That would be good. Tammy? I didn't hear you. Oh, I'm not muted. You're, you're, you're having connection problems, but I heard your voice, so I'm going to take that as you're here. Uh, Alex? I'm here. Alex, present. Thank you. Chris? Present. Thank you. Lee? Here. Bob? Here. And I'm, um, I'm Austin, and I am here. Um, it's been a tradition of the board to extend a gift to the staff uh, to recognize their extraordinary service uh, during the year and to help them celebrate um, the holidays. No year in recent memory uh, has required the level of ingenuity, creativity, persistence, and dare I say it, courage uh, of our staff as this one has. And they have risen uh, to the challenge, I think, uh, remarkably, remarkably well and served the town um, with distinction in a, in a really troubled time. So um, I, I, I guess the question is, uh, do we, are we prepared to uh, uh, provide funds in order to uh, provide a gift to the staff? Sharon, do you want to tell us what we're talking about? Yeah, so um, uh, as in the past, you all have given each staff member a $5 gift certificate to Amherst Coffee. Um, so uh, we love that. So thank you. Okay, so are we, um, are we ready to, like, let's, I move that we give the staff uh, gift cards to Amherst Coffee, as Sharon's just indicated. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Uh, I just want to make clear so that no one is, uh, no one misunderstands the cost of this gift comes from the donations of individual trustees. It's not taken out of the library, not right. taken out of the library budget. We're not diverting any funds that would go otherwise. Okay. Any other discussion? I've already sent mine in. Mm -hmm. Me too. <laughs> uh, okay. I guess there's a, there's a, there's a rush to, <laughs> to be the teacher's pet. That's good. Uh -huh, so, that's us. Good okay. girl. <laughs> so We're all in, good in company, Lee. All in, <laughs> all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Thank you. That's um, that's great. Okay, Sharon. So we're here to do another in a series of um, library chats. <laughs> uh, among the subjects that we've covered before are its sustainability. We've talked about the repair estimate on the building. We've walked through the plans for the building. And today we were going to talk a little bit about historical preservation. And I'm going to turn it over to Sharon. And again, Chris, I have to leave about 525. So if I disappear, you would please adjourn the trustees. Sharon. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, so as Austin said, this uh, session this, uh, will focus on historic preservation, uh, specifically in terms of preservation of the original 1928 portion of the Jones Library Building and the preservation opportunities that this MBLC grant is offering the town of Amherst. And these are opportunities which are not affordably available to the town if it does not accept the grant. This is a matter of great importance to the trustees of the library uh, who really appreciate the historic value of this unique building and would like to exercise thoughtfully their stewardship of it for the town. So in order to dig, dig deeper into this topic, we've invited two experts uh, to join us this afternoon. And so please welcome, first off is Steve Schreiber, uh, professor and chair of the Department of Architecture at UMass Amherst. Hi, Steve, thank you for coming. Hi. And coming soon, uh, Hank is, is working on bringing, on bringing in Eldra Dominique Walker, who is an assistant professor and M Design Graduate Program Director at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Um, 
thank you both for joining us. I, kn I know uh, Eldra is having trouble uh, logging on to the Zoom. So how about we start with you, Steve? Um, I know you were going to be you were going to be number two, but you've just got promoted to number one. Um, would you like to say a few words, and then when Eldra joins us, she can she will have a, a presentation to present to everybody. Um, thank you so much for the introduction. And I'm just going to, because I don't have your cell phone number, but I'm wondering if, Lauren, if you're at your house, if you could possibly um, see if you could also help Eldra. So I, I have no other way of communicating with you than, than this way. So um, thank you so much. So this is supposed to be, I was supposed to be here basically for support of Eldra, but I am the, the chair of architecture at UMass. I'm an architect. And um, I'm also a town councilor, so I need to be clear that I'm not here in my role as an elected town councilor. And I, I am trying to think of what other um, disclosures I should make here. But I have been very much following the library project to the degree that my students, actually working with another faculty member, Isla Xamia, we took on this project as a design studio project about three years ago. And so many of the trustees that were, many of the trustees were part of that particular uh, process that you came to our, our the different reviews that we had. But I, I think that that helped a number of people, our students and also me um, really get a grasp on really what the issues are. So as part of that process, we got from the library, the actually the original set of working drawings from 1993 edition, and we left them up in the studio for our students to look at. And so we happened to have a guest lecturer from another department come to the building that day. So she was actually speaking for landscape architecture. She's both an architect and landscape architect. And she walked through the building and she saw the drawings and she said, I did those drawings. And when I, when I was an intern and I worked for the architecture firm that was in New Hampshire that did the library project. So I asked her all the questions about what went on, you know, in 19, the 1993 edition. And so she described a kind of a magnif magnificent ambition back in 1993 about how the library would be added onto and and it didn't come to that. It, so the basic idea was there, but what was actually construction was very much the term of art is value engineered. So the, there, whatever, there are budget constraints, there are site constraints, all the usual things, but there are also material changes. So she kind of talk, worked me, talked me through the, the set of drawings of what the ambition was and what the reality was. So she also has visited, she lives in New York. She's visits her, um, somebody in her family goes, to, went to Amherst College. So she comes to their reunions. And every time she comes to Amherst, she goes to visit the Jones. And so she too has seen that 1993 edition not live up to its expectations. So um, I, like many others, my first introduction to Amherst was through the library because I needed to use the internet and I, uh, walked through those big grand doors and had a completely different expectation from what I saw and what I, what I found. So it didn't occur to me at that time that this, this problematic 1993 edition was, um, I'm just reading a text that came through. <laughs> anyway, this 1993 edition was part of the problem because I didn't really understand the increments of how this was built. But you know, certainly exercising or you know, doing something with that 93 edition seemed to be a critical issue. So in the meantime, you all, the library trustees, have you know, had permission to hire what I, who I find to be the preeminent historic preservation architecture firm in the country. Um, as your consultants to this. And so I had the good, well, I, full disclosure, I worked for them in the 19, I, let me see if I can do the math here. I worked for them in the 1980s when I was a, a wee lad. But, um, but I also had a chance to work with them at UMass when they were hired to do the old chapel renovation. So I was on the, basically the program committee for that. And the, 
firm, which was originally known as Anderson Nader Feingold and Nader Feingold Alexander, now Feingold Alexander Associates. The, the initials keep moving to the, um, to the left. Um, completely thrilled that they were interested in working on the old chapel project. And I thought that they solved on that particular project, which has vexed the campus for decades. It's yep. never been able to, to, so they solved the major problem, which is how to get into the building without destroying the building by um, kind of a simple move. So to me, that was, and I'm an architect, but that was sort of a head slapping um, move to put this, basically this box on this glass box on one side that was very clearly in addition to that, and then allow access to onto the main level. You know, I'm sure that you you have all been in there. And I'm actually really pleased that they, I was just looking at their website, really pleased that they have that on one of their future projects on, on the website. So I've also, another project that they've done in the area that I love is the Holyoke Public Library. So the Holyoke Public Library is not a dissimilar project to what the Jones is, is facing, that they're, was a beautiful historic building that didn't meet current accessibility, et cetera, et cetera. So they, they um, attached onto that this beautiful, or the design was this beautiful kind of modern, very clearly not the same architecture to, to it. So one can make a distinction between what's old and what's new. So um, yeah, so that's another one of my favorite buildings in the area. Um, it's worth noting, and I actually see that he's on the line here, or at least he was, that Jim Alexander was um, honored as Mass Historic Commission's Lifetime Achievement Award winner for an individual last year, which is a you know, pretty extraordinary honor. So if you read the, just Google that, and if you read what they say about him, it's all true. So this is from having worked with him directly many years ago, but then also worked with him as part of the user group on the, the project at UMass. So back to the project at hand. So I've read a lot of the commentary that has gone through the Gazette and some of the blogs and you know over the years, and I've talked to people that are for this, against this, in my various capacities as town meeting member, as uh, member of the planning board and now as a member of the town councilor. And uh, I think that the, the building that the current Jones, the original Jones is, is actually beautiful. So <laughs> I read a recent column by Alex Kent and that's the one part that I take exception to is that I actually think that the, I, I love the Jones and I love the bull, in at Bullwood and I love the fraternities all done by the same architect. So they're very typical or very exemplary, um, great examples of the spirit of that particular time, say the 1920s, where there was this romanticizing about this sort of rural past of this area. So both the Jones and the Inn at Boltwood were the original structures were designed in a way to look like they were built as incremental buildings. Mm -hmm. So they sort of mix materials. They look like they were added onto, like the original Jones was meant to look like it was added onto over years. But you can particularly see that in the inn at Boltwood, that if you look at that street edge along Spring Street and you asked anyone, um, was this all built at the same time or was it built over years? They'd say it was all built over years. And the answer is no, it wasn't. So it was renovated, you know, 10 years ago and added onto in the part that you really can't see, but it was, it was designed to look like an incremental building. At some point you have to cut your losses, right? So at some point um, I read, I used to listen to Click and Clack, now I read Click and Clack or whatever that variation is. And they talk about when, you, when it's time to cut your losses on your car. So the same thing can be, um, applied to any, you know, to a building also. So I think as heartbreaking it is, and I know that there are people even on this call that were part of the, the building crew for the 93 edition. I think that it's, it's it, to me, it seems like um, it's time to cut the losses. There's, I don't, our students couldn't figure out a way to fix it as it 
is now. Um, I know the architects have looked at that. It's it's not it's it's not it to me it doesn't seem possible. So going back to more of what the building was originally and you know back to the original Jones and then starting from that as a base. And I'm really talking about the exterior. Um, then some re redesign of the even the original Jones to me makes a lot of sense. I um, and I really have followed what your plan is by attending as many public meetings as I can and watching recordings. So yeah, so that's where that's my introductory statement. And as I've been saying that, there have been a number of texts coming in that are, I think, from Eldra, but okay, or from from Lauren, I think. Steve, yeah. could you uh, could I ask you to just elaborate a little bit on um, the various ways in which the the original building will be uh, preserved? In other words, what does historic preservation actually mean, given your your um, knowledge of the Jones building? Because I think there's there's some confusion generally around the term historic preservation. Yeah, so yeah, it would be helpful if you gave a little context. Yeah, so this is where I need my phone a friend. I need uh, Eldra because she actually teaches our courses in historic preservation. So I come to it from a point of view of not of education actually, but of practice. But in really my primary practice in this area was with the, the firm now known as Feingold, you know, Feingold Alexander. But really the critical thing is to figure out what is important about the Jones. So was there a period of time, and actually this doesn't apply so much to the Jones, but in the case of something that's been altered you know, over time, what you wanna do is you wanna figure out what the critical date was that you wanna bring it back to. So this might be the case of say, a building on the town common that has been, you know, like, completely altered over time that you might say that the critical period for this was 1970 because of this happened and that happened. So the Jones as it was originally built is really still very visible and still very obvious. It's still the most prominent view that, the most memorable view that most have. So preserving that, you know, that shell there or really the, so we can see it in Hank's screensaver. Um, you, you know, that image of the Jones is critical. So obviously updating it in terms of current weatherization and current accessibility is important, but it, to me, it's the, that particular shell. That's the critical thing. So inside, we haven't talked that much about inside, and I will admit that I'm less familiar with um, all, and Eldra knows so much more, and you guys all know so much more about what it was like as built, and I'm certainly, you know, aware of that from doing this with my students, but also some of the rooms are worth bringing back to where they were either when the Jones was built or some other period if they were added on later, but they don't necessarily have to be used that way, but to, it's really the physical space that's the critical part. So, so if I go to Alexander, and I, I have to keep checking myself to make sure I'm using the right name, <laughs> is, um, we're pioneers of, this is not an adaptive reuse project. This is being a library being used as a library, but they were the um, pioneers of really adaptive reuse where you say, take a train station and you turn that into, you know, offices. Actually, um, Quincy Market would be the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the quintessential example of, of that. But actually their old, the Fine Gold Alexander's old Boston City Hall would be another example. So you preserve basically the, the presence of the building, but then you use it for something else. But we're not, we're not talking about that. Well, I think that's a really good ex example, because what we've, we've ended up with is a kind of, and it's not in the way you're describing it, the libraries ended up with what I'm going to call adaptive reuse in mm -hmm. the bad sense of the word. Yeah. So um, in one sense, the 93 edition left the library building, the original building, intact and preserved. But many of the rooms in the building, which have most historic value and are, are most appealing aesthetically, in part because of their historic value, have been reused and made into, um, you know, 
private spaces, spaces for staff. Yeah. And um, again, I'm just trying to think about from, the, from an architectural point of view, is getting those building, those rooms back into public use, would that generally be considered part of the kinds of things that you want to do when you do historic preservation? Absolutely. If there are rooms that are were designed to be primarily public, you know, the public rooms. So every building has sort of the primary rooms and then support rooms. So the support rooms are typically the behind the scenes storage, yeah. things like that. even conference rooms, some conference rooms or offices. And then the primary rooms in the case of a library would be the more public, but absolutely bringing them back to the public view, which I know is one of the intents of, of you know, this project is is critical. So there was something called, the other thing I wanted to talk about was, um, there was a previous campus planning director at UMass named Dennis Winford, who is now in the private sector. And he used a term that I've never heard of before, which is buddy building. And buddy building means that you can save um, an historic building by attaching a new, a modern building onto it. So, so obviously like the Holyoke Public Library that, we've, that I just mentioned um, is a great example of a buddy building. So the buddy is the modern one. And in the modern building, the new building, you can provide um, elevator access, you can provide modern systems like modern HVAC that can then be fed into the original building. Um, what am I missing? So, so that has been basically the strategy that UMass is trying to do to preserve a, a substantial part of its historic fabric. So one example at UMass, the um, old chapel doesn't quite fit into that because the buddy isn't big enough, but right behind it, South College is a terrific example of Lee Edwards' old home. Yep. <laughs> In yep. fact, her office That's is fabulous. in- yeah, so the buddy gorgeous. was the part that was built downhill from South College, and then the um, that enabled elevator access, new sy systems to be put in, you, you know, bigger rooms um, or more modern rooms where necessary. Yeah. I have a question about yeah. interior space, about Old Chapel vis-a-vis -vis, um, the Jones Library, because there's a lot of concern about woodwork. Nope. And my sense, I mean, I don't, you know, my memory is not totally fabulous, but my sense is what they did in Old Chapel was evoke the old woodwork. I don't think everything that's in there is exactly what the old woodwork was, but when you go inside, you have the same feeling. Yeah. So I think that's right. And there, there are people on the call that know more than I do, but yeah, I think that's right. So, uh, and would that, if that, uh, did that achieve the status, status of historic preservation? Um, I'm getting a little bit above my pay grade because I don't know exactly what happened in Old Chapel, but I, I think it's an important, so there's an old quip about in the historic preservation world about the guy that has George Washington's ax. And it's George Washington's axe, only the handle has been replaced and the, the head has been replaced, but otherwise it occupies the same space. So, so in a way that if you think of any building as being changed over time anyway, so like even the original Jones, you know, it's had a new roof, it's had a new this, it's had a new that. So, so the amount of original, original disappears over time just through regular, through regular maintenance. So I don't know the specifics of you know, what's critical in the Jones itself, but certainly disassembling and reassembling or, um, you know, I don't think it, I don't think it has to be. The exact same. The exact, original. Right. right, yeah. As long as it's not George Washington's teeth. Right, <laughs> exactly. You know, I watched the um, PBS special on the rebuilding of the Notre, the Notre Dame mm -hmm. in Paris. And it was extraordinary that they're trying to, looking at getting stone from the exact same quarry that this was used for the original Notre Dame. The only problem is it's under Paris. So they'd have to undermine Paris to, to get the stone. So the next option is to find a stone that's similar to that, which is quarries outside of Paris. 
And the same thing with the timbers that obviously there are no more timbers within a very short haul of central Paris. So they're finding, you know, groves of similar trees of mm -hmm. a similar age that are, you know, elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And if you can't do that, then you can never do anything. You know, exactly. Thank you. So Steve, uh, I'm gonna just invite before, um, uh, before other trustees jump in, I'm gonna invite uh, attendees, if you have a question, you could relay that question through the question and answer function or through the chat function. Uh, that would be um, that would be great. So while we're waiting to see whether we get any questions from the audience or any of the other trustees have a question for Steve uh, so far. So I'm gonna ask you, hearing none, I'm gonna ask you the question about the relationship between the buddy building, which I love, Mm -hmm. and, and the historic building. So I take it that one of the things that we should have been concerned about, meaning we were concerned about it, is the way in which the buddy building fits with the historic building. In other words, mm -hmm. does its design complement? Does its design overwhelm? And uh, first of all, is that right? I mean, you, you want to think about the buddy building in relationship to this, this, the historic building. Yeah, so I think a working philosophy is that you don't want to muddy what was the original, you don't want to muddy what was, uh, what it is that you're really trying to showcase. So the original library is what I would argue would be that yeah. Hank's view is what we don't. Um, so, so from there, it becomes discretion. In other words, from mm -hmm. there, and I know that the various iterations that the architects and the trustees have gone through have ranged from what I would say were very modern to what now seems to be the, be the preferred scheme, which is more of an historic, yeah. closer to what the original library is. I think that's all within the range of, of you, you know, all in the, within the range of what I would consider to be appropriate. And I'm only Keep in mind that I'm, I'm only one voice. Of, yep. Um, yeah, so like the South College example is you have to kind of stare to figure out when the old South College ends and when the new edition begins, but you can see it. So there's similar colors, there's similar patterns. One's a very modern interpretation of the old one. But the late, you know, the, you know, certainly where the, uh, where you all have been headed to me seems like a very reasonable approach that maintains sort of this um, modern, uh, you know, there, there is a sense that there is a modern building added onto an historic building, but that they complement each other. By the way, another example of a, what I find to be a really interesting buddy building is the five college, well, it's really the Emerald's College building right, ne right near here. So, behind, yeah. and I call it the Fiber Arts Center, although it was a Fiber Arts Center uh -huh. only for a very short period of time. It was a Baptist uh -huh. church, right? Yeah, originally a Baptist church. And I call I, it the Peter, I, the Peter Pan bus stop. The Peter Pan bus stop. I remember those days too. Yep, yep. That we could actually get your tickets there. So, um, but I find that to be a really great sort of buddy building also. Uh -huh. And actually the Kuhn Riddle, who are the associate architects for the Jones project were the architects for that. But so, so the presence on the common is of this historic Absolutely. building. And then the behind is this addition. So the other thing is, <laughs> the other part about Amherst that I love are the behinds. So I love going be, like in the space where Laughing Dog Bikes is because you can see how actually these buildings have been added on to over time. So there's like a facade, there's a, the civic facade on the front yeah. Then the utility right. uh, part of the back. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. I, I think um, I'm just going to just quibble. I think that the, well, what you described is, is really great description of what happens when you go behind. What's wonderful, <laughs> at least from my point of view, about what FAA has proposed is that this build, this, this addition, this buddy building, uh, you know, has an integrity to uh, to itself um, as well as a complement to the historical building. 
And that seems to me to be the achievement that the building has a kind of integrity to itself. But now, given the good work of the trustees um, and the director, the, the way in which this buddy building is going to look is going to complement in its roof line and perhaps in its materials what that historic building will, um, will, will look like. So are there, um, are there, I've got a couple of questions from the audience, so let's go to those. So uh, one question says, I'm curious about how historic preservation will be balanced with staff needs and future flexibility. People have used the library very differently over the last 30 years and there'll likely be changes in the next 30. Will there be surveys and focus groups with staff and with patrons to find out what they um, like about the space? and how it is or isn't meeting needs of the community. So this is a question for our distinguished director. Can you read it again? I'm curious about how to balance the staff needs and future flexibility. Oh, that's so true. Um, so I, I would say, so as a staff member and, and somebody who has been on the uh, the design team since the beginning, I think the architects and the building committee and the trustees have done an incredible job of listening to the staff. Um, uh, it's not always like that. You know, sometimes architects just want things to look pretty. And, and, and for us, yes, we want it to look pretty, but um, it's really important that it function beautifully for the staff as well as for the patrons, because that's our problem right now is that it doesn't. Um, and so that leads me into the flexibility piece. Uh, uh, you know, the advice coming from the MBLC and, and what the architects have learned over time is that the best thing we can do is to make this these spaces as flexible as possible because holy cow, um, technology moves at the speed of light now and, and what we think is gonna happen in five years you know, could happen tomorrow and uh, we just don't know. So the more flexible these spaces are and the furnishings, uh, the better. That, uh, that way, you know, whether we're talking 10 years from now or 30 years from now, we can rearrange those spaces um, to adapt to our needs. And it's very clear uh, we've, from the beginning of this project, held uh, a variety of public meetings uh, which people have expressed their views about the project. And uh, in the early phases of the design, this question about what it is that people liked about the space, um, we heard very clearly from the public some things that they liked about the space and uh, worked with the architects to try to respond to those uh, to those those preferences. Uh, and, and I do think that the, what Sharon had said, again, Steve could tell me whether I'm wrong in this. I think that the, this principle of flexibility in architectural design, I think is very well realized in what Feindel Alexander have, uh, have come up with. Um, and some of that has to do with the possibility of using rooms uh, big, and then also by arranging furniture, using rooms small. And that's realized in the, um, in the plan that we are, uh, that we've endorsed and hope the town will endorse as well. You Steve? know, I should mention one thing about the buddy building is that um, hopefully 40 years from now, 50 years from now, when the next edition is planned for the Jones, the addition will be also considered to be a, a legacy building that is worth preserving and protecting. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of examples of buildings that have been built over time, which each part of the building, because I've been sort of kind of dismissive about the 1993 edition, but I think that Feingold Alexander has the track, you know, this particular firm has the track record of creating buildings that then become legacy buildings in themselves and are, are you know, it's not yeah. just about uh, um, accentuating the work of another different architect. It's about also creating this new this new piece. That's great. There's another question. Um, will there be user participatory discussion with current architects about space use and traffic flows that drew them to the Jones over the libraries, over other libraries in the first place? So that's a terrific question. We finished. Um, the first phase of the work with our architects. And it was a long and complicated one. 
which got us to, um, I hope this is the right architectural term, Steve, finalized schematic design. But we are going to, um, if the town approves uh, the project, we're gonna move into the next phase, which is called design development. And as we move into design development, uh, there'll be an opportunity for more conversations with the architects about the way in which the building is gonna be um, used though uh, this, the finalized schematics will be the basis on which the subsequent design work uh, ha happens. So what we've got now, finalized schematics, but the next phase is design development where those finalized schematics begin to move into plans that the architects and builders can actually, um, can actually use. Was that an accurate description, Steve? That sounded right. Yeah, that's correct. So schematic design to design development to, con to basically construction drawings, yeah. Great. Okay, are there other questions from the trustees for Steve? Okay, other questions from the... From I see the, a couple in chat. The Q and A, Austin. Yeah. Do I mean, uh, oh, here, here we go. What is the status? So this is a question for um, Sharon, I believe. What is the status of the historic structures report and when will the Mass Historic Commission be involved in approving the, the designs? I assume I'll call you back. So the historic structures report, uh, that's being worked on by oh, well, Dominique. Yeah. So I'm, I'm sorry that that was gonna be a part of her discussion, but she is working on that. Um, I'm not sure what the deadline is. I didn't get a chance to ask her. Um, and then what was the second? When will the Mass Historic Commission be involved in approving the designs? Oh, so yeah, so we've been in contact with Mass Historic throughout this whole process, um, you know, as part of the MBLC's uh, grant program, we had to notify them and that happened. Um, and, and they agree that the best time for them to get involved in more detail is when we hit design development. So I just want to inflect a little bit what you said. They didn't, it's not the best time. That's when Mass Historic said they wanted to be involved. Correct. Uh, that when we're in design development, when we have gone beyond final schematics is when it would be appropriate for them to review what it is that we are doing. It wasn't that they just wanted us to do it. That's when they have told us to do it. Okay, so the next question uh, is, many in Amherst seem to be offended by modern buildings. Steve, are you offended by modern buildings? Um, only when they speak up. Okay, so let's go. Sometimes to the rest of I am sometimes offended by modern buildings, but I'm also sometimes offended by historic buildings. But but so um, let's get the rest of the question. Many in Amherst seem to be offended by modern buildings, but isn't it important to not have the Buddy Building be a faux reference, like the 1993 to the original building? I've recently visited the South Hadley and Athol libraries that are visually pleasing but modern. So the question. Yeah, is, and um, I haven't been to the Athol one. I've been to the South Hadley one, and um, I've been to the regular Hadley one. I mean, the regular Hadley, <laughs> the, the one that's uh, just opening, I mean, on the about yeah. to open. Um, yeah, uh, we can debate and discuss the, the first line is a really, really interesting one. And I, I think that it might have been Austin that said um, that <laughs> something about, about progressive, there, there's something interesting about pro progressive communities um, being offended by modern buildings or, or what I, I said I Steve was that Amherst is a progressive community it just hates change yeah yeah that was it I knew it was something like that um I think that they're modern means different things so th this the author is using small m so small m means to be basically of the time you know contemporary mm -hmm. um there I think that we're actually in a really interesting period of architecture right now so We've learned a lot from modernism with a capital M. We've learned a lot from historicism. And actually I'd consider the Jones to be a model example of historicism, you know, trying to evoke a period of which it was not. You know. And uh, we've learned about urbanism, how to build good communities. And a lot of us have been hit in the face. So probably one of the most important things to happen to Amherst was what's now known as the Bank of America building, mm -hmm. because that is now basically the, what everyone fears is that this will be the next Bank of America building. 
So, but uh, then my counter is another modern building right in the heart of downtown is the uh, five call the Baptist church edition, you know, that we were just talking about, which I find to be an extraordinarily compatible, you know, modern building. And actually right next door to, the, even if you go onto the Amherst College campus, there, there are a lot of really beautiful modern buildings that are, use historical references, but are not. So this, it's kind of the best of modernism meets historicism. Like, um, so I'm, yeah, I, I completely agree with the second sentence too. The, you know, um, that was the thing about the 1993 building is that you, if you're standing in front of the, the uh, on the Prospect Street, you really, it was hard to see where the original building was and where the new building, where the new building was. So I, I think some sort of a division so that that is clear that this is an addition is important. And I believe that that's what is being attempted here. Yeah. So yeah, so I, I tend to agree with all of this, except the one part I haven't been to the Apple library, but that's on my to-do list as soon as I'm allowed to go out of Amherst. In fact, uh, as soon as I'm allowed to go out of my house. Yeah, yeah some of us visited the Apple library um, uh, and it's an extraordinary, uh, it's an extra, I, I thought it was an extraordinary um, renovation. I mean, I think it's a wonderful, yeah. uh, wonderful renovation. It, it didn't have the level of historic preservation that we want here because of its prior building, but I thought it was, was quite extraordinary. Um, so uh, here's an, you know, again, here's this, right? Can this chat be continued to find another date so we can hear from Eldra? I think that makes a lot of I think that makes a lot of sense. Of course, we'll try to um, ar arrange that. Another observation: the Cambridge Public Library is another example of the old and the new. The Cambridge Public Library and the Boston Public Library, and actually, the Boston Public Library is a really interesting one because that's an addition to an addition to an addition. Actually, it's a renovation of an addition to an addition, all with very three very prominent architects working in a row. So it's the Kimmead White meets Philip Johnson meets William Ron and Associates. And the Cambridge Public Library is, I don't know who the original architect was, but William Ron was the architect of, um, of that renovation slash addition. But so I, I think that you're, you know, I think that's the right family that's particularly the Cambridge Public Library, which is a smaller, is, is um, sort of the family of what I think that the Jones Library will can be. So that's a really good, if you, in the old days, we'd say, go get in, get in, your car and drive get, in there. get in your, get on the Peter Pan bus and go visit it. But now go look at the, go look at the website. Tammy. Yeah, I used to use the Cambridge Public Library when I lived in Cambridge, when it was still the small one. And I have subsequently been in it with my family who, who were living in Cambridge and explored the edition. And I think they did a phenomenal job with the new edition, but also with restoring the original small library. And, and you can see people love being in there because there were a lot of people in the older part as well yeah. as people in the newer part. Um, and, and part of the newer part was the children's, which was just phenomenal. Yeah. yeah. Well, as you know, the plan, right, to follow up on that, the plan that we are uh, hope to see developed will open up more of the historic building to the public yeah. than, than is now available. So from the point of view of, of people who love the historic building, uh, we hope they will fully embrace the renovation because they're gonna get more of the thing they love. And uh, I think that's really an extraordinary um, achievement. The current downtown modern scene is disturbingly ugly to the art artistically inclined. The issue is not about change. It's about destroying the unique New England character that draws visitors from all over our valley to patronize their local establishments. Well, the answer is we are in heated agreement. That's, what we're, that's why we have Steve here, because no one envisions destroying yeah. uh, the un unique character of the uh, Jones building. If you think it was destroyed by the 93 edition, uh, then, but most people don't think it was destroyed by the '93 edition. Yeah. This, this edition is not going to, not going to do any damage to uh, the historic building, and we hope it's going to enhance it. Steve. So, so three of my favorite communities 
in the, in the Connecticut River Valley, in New England, let's just leave it to that, are right on the Connecticut River and you just go north to Greenfield, Brattleboro, and then to White River Junction. So, so um, Greenfield's a really interesting one. Of course, they are in the process, you know, they're also in the, the, the library um, business. <laughs> and I know that Sharon um, has some experience there. So, but the, um, in downtown Greenfield, the, uh, there's a, uh, the courthouse is a perfect example of a buddy building. So the courthouse has, it's a, a historic building on, my goodness, I'm not gonna come up with uh, the name of the street. So it's Hope Street meets, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna come up with it. Um, but behind it is a very modern building. So that's a buddy, you know, basically the buddy building concept. Uh, Brattleboro, New England isn't all about you know, 1880 or 1890, or even trying to replicate that. New England, like anywhere else in um, the, the world is about some history, some change. I completely agree that there are parts to, uh, to Amherst. I'll go back to my thread in a second. So like, we wanna protect the town common. We wanna protect, you know, there are a number of things and a lot of them have to do with open space that we wanna protect. So Brattleboro moving on north, another one of my favorite communities, but it has some very modern buildings like the Brattleboro, like the, um, I don't know what the, the official name is, but the co-op building, which is a mixed use building right on the river. It's a very modern building and you might have to squint and say, um, is it actually modern or is it not modern? But it's, you know, an example of an historic modern building. And then White River Junction is the big surprise because um, I've known about White River Junction my entire life, um, having taken the bus there or the train there. And oftentimes it's trying to get um, out as quickly as possible, but now it's the place that everybody wants to get into as much as possible. So this is a very quintessential, you know, New England village. And it is um, a mix of modern and historic, um, some three-story buildings, some four-story buildings. Um, and to me, that's quintessential New England. So we, we can, one problem is that if you try to, and I don't, you know, I might be reading way more into this question. If you try to freeze a community into a certain time period, then it becomes really difficult to ever build. But if you allow, if you sort of accept that communities are living, growing things, then it's much easier to accept change. But I, some parts should be constant, like the common, the, you know, the new Kendrick Park, you know, things like that, mostly streetscape and basically the bulk, I think. Great. I wasn't spoken from an historic preservation point of view, but maybe it was. Great. Well, I think you've helped us understand what historic preservation means. And yeah. I think part of the misunderstanding of historic preservation, some people think historic preservation means no change. You preserve yeah. it as it is. And what you've helped us see is that historic preservation doesn't necessarily mean no change. It, and, and again, in our case, um, I love your reference to the to the Hanks screensaver that uh, yeah. <laughs> that preserving that that view, that feel uh, for the Jones as it faces the town is critical historic preservation and as is opening up historic features of the Jones that have been hidden. So, uh, yeah, so the, another comment here about the Cambridge Public Library and um, yeah, I'd love to know what the people of Cambridge think. So the, the context is slightly different. So that, that library is in, it's kind of in a park you know, in other words, it's not right on the urban edge like the Jones is. It's more of a park setting. And then the Ringe, Cambridge Rings Latin High School is right there also, all in this more of a park setting. So without, I'd love to know what the community, you, you know, feedback was on that. I can, I think many of us consider Amherst and Cambridge to be siblings i'm not sure if cambridge sees it that way but i but um you know we're both college towns right so this question uh is a really this observation is a really good one but i don't think it's apt for what we're doing uh, it's not a yeah. glass box that we are adding to the back of the yeah uh, jones library the cambridge uh 
model is a discussion of what a good historic preservation might be, but a glass box is not what we are adding to the back of the back of the library. So are there other questions from the trustees? Alex. Not not a question so much as I second. I I have lots of questions, but they're for Eldra. I don't want to put Steve on the spot because he's been really clear that this was supposed to be Eldra's chat. And so I would really love it if we could try this again with Eldra and we're, we're and, gonna we're gonna we're gonna do yeah. it. You're, you're, yeah, you're, that's great. Okay. So Steve, um, let me just make sure, given that I'm not seeing any other questions, um, I want to, first of all, thank you. You've, you've, as they say, risen to the occasion. You've done two parts in one person. That's pretty good. We're really incredibly grateful for your insight and for your thoughtfulness in talking about historic preservation. Of course, we're all grateful for your distinguished service to the town uh, <laughs> in uh, your current capacity. Uh, Sharon, did you want to say one last word before we adjourn? No, I just want to echo what Austin just said. said. Steve, thank you so much for this. It's fascinating. I am, uh, I am, I love talking about the Jones and I love talking about Amherst. So thank you so much for inviting me. It's our pleasure. So now uh, we need to move to adjourn the trustees meeting. Would a trustee make a motion to adjourn? Yeah. Lee, had, uh, Chris has made the motion. Is there a second? Somebody needs to speak. Second. Good. Okay. I'm going to ask you again by name to vote as to whether or not we may adjourn. Chris Hoffman. Um, I move we uh, yes adjourn. Yes. Okay. Lee Edwards. Yes. Tammy Ely. Yes. Bob Pam. I'm willing. I'm <laughs> willing. <laughs> Willing, but not enthusiastic. Um, Alex Lefebvre. Yes. And Austin Serrett says yes. And again, I want to thank the attendees for uh, coming to this uh, library chat. And we will look forward to seeing you in the future at future library chats. Everybody stay, stay safe, please. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>